and welcome to Talking F All. We're a podcast from Grand Prix Grandstand that does more or less what that title says. We talk about F All. More specifically, we talk about Formula All, and that means Formula One, Formula Two, Formula Three, and the W Series. I'm your host, Jim Kimberly, and I can't be talking F All about such a great weekend in France alone. So joining me are my GP Grandstand partners, Timo Elders Daly and Jacob Phillips. And it's great to have both of you with me. But let's forego the polite introductions as we've got plenty to go through this time. We've got to talk about a crazy one, a boring one, and a damp one. And that's not the three of us. That's F3's three very different races producing three different winners. Victor Martins having a secret home race attribute in his loadout. And does the F3 grid need even more cars for Arthur Leclerc to overtake? We've also got the motorsport world deciding to make our podcast out of date with some academy news and, of course, a titanic strategic battle in F1 with Mercedes versus Red Bull. But let's start from the start. And Jacob, Frederick Resty took pole, but it wasn't really a weekend dominated by Frederick Resty. Dennis Hauger and Victor Martins, double podiums and three great races in Formula 3. Yeah, it was a fantastic weekend and, you know, it looked for all the world that Dennis Hauger was going to secure pole in that fantastic qualifying session. And then out of nowhere, sort of in the last few minutes, I think it was the last three minutes, Frederick Vesti, you know, the Mercedes Junior grabbed pole. And I think he didn't actually um, secure any purple uh, sectors in, in any of the three sectors. That was a nice surprise. But mm. yeah, it was um, after that, it was slightly anonymous from Vesti, really. He, he never really contended for a win. And yeah, it was just a weekend after the, you know, the great start. It's a bit poor for him after that. Yeah, the, uh, the races I thought were terrific but the qualifying the qualifying was a uh, one worth watching as well and i'm not the biggest qualifying fan usually uh hauger looking strong and victor martin the rookie also looking strong he looked great at spain and he was what about six hundredths of a second off then and vesti like you say came out with a stonking lap but yeah there's some some really good really good drivers in formula three this year timo yeah, it's uh, it's something that's nice across both F2 and F3 this year so far. I'm kind of in qualifying, especially it's just all so really so damn close to be perfectly honest. And it's just it's refreshing to see that because again, F1, you know, it's going to more than likely be aside from when Ferrari have a have a good day, it's going to be Red Bull or Mercedes. So for it to be such a, a mix up in F2 and F3 this weekend in particular, it's just great to see. And what, it's what you want because then you know that with the reverse grid combination, you're going to get some spicy stuff. Yeah, the reverse grid is, I'm, I'm still not sure on the reverse grid twice, but I'm turning into a big fan of a uh, the three race format because we've had, I think, every single feeder series event so far, one of the three races has been a bit meh and the other two have been, been terrific. And race one, Jacob, one of the best Formula 3 races we're going to see this year, I think. Yeah, and certainly on a circuit where we didn't assume it would happen. And you say that one race is always quite boring in the weekend, and it's usually the, the first one, and this just wasn't the case. You know, I, I was glued to, a, glued to my screen. It was, you know, fantastic to wake up so, so early and have a, you know, a race to really wake me up. We had, was it five different leaders throughout the race? You know, we were kept guessing for a long, long time that who was going to win. You know, Callum Williams from pole there, you know, he, he lost the lead, but managed to get it back as well. You know, Wasser battling for the lead and then obviously lost it and, fell down the order to use that uh, off-track pass. But, yeah, you know, and uh, Dennis Hauger coming through for the victory there was fantastic, and it kept us guessing, which is what F3 is all about. Uh, Alex Smolier, I think, is uh, the one you're referring to for the victory. Oh, in of the course, end. yeah. Alex Smolier. Alex Smolier, of course, yeah. Yeah, and Smolier, easy to say, Hauger with his championship leader. Yes, yeah, Smolier just seemed to really surprise me. And I am I know he's uh, possibly a championship contender, um, and ART are pretty quick, but... Were you surprised to see how fast he was, Timo, uh, in in France this weekend? Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of a bit. I'm trying to think who reminds me of because there was a driver in F2, I think, Baku, who was similar to this. It was just kind of you wouldn't expect you wouldn't you weren't expecting bad things from them, but you weren't expecting such a such good things from them either. And it was just he seemed to have just more more grip and more speed than any of the other people in, in that race, and it was just. The, the, the racetrack was his oyster essentially and it was just really nice to see him just mm-hmm. wait and time it perfectly and then I think the thing I loved about it most was that he and everyone else fighting for the victory there it was all incredibly close racing but there weren't any incidents I mean the only incident as such was Iwasa when he went over the over the white line but even then it's it's 
there's no damage done to any of the cars. It's just an unfortunate time penalty. So it was just great to see that close racing from a crop of drivers that are they're all essentially rookies in one sense or another because F3 is the bottom rung on in terms of F1, F2 and F3. So for them to all show that kind of level of maturity for driving is just great. Now, TB, you watched Formula 3 a lot more than Jacob and I did last year. And Smolia, um, from what I could tell from, from statistics and looking at results, he wasn't necessarily uh, somebody you'd be thinking would be winning races this year, but now he's won two. Uh, are you surprised to see how, how well he's done so far this year with two victories in six races? So you're, you're stretching my memory a little bit there because it was, it was so long between the last race of the last year and the first race this year and then again between the last two rounds. But um, yeah, it's one of the things it's, I think coming into, into Barcelona this time around, it was, he was a name I definitely recognised and remembered, but it, that was about it. It wasn't for any other particular reason. Um, he may have had some, some good results. I think he did all, all right in some, in some races, but again, it wasn't anything magical in comparison to the likes of uh, Vesti, Sargent and Piastri last year. So um, it was a pleasant surprise to see him up there. And hopefully it's it's not one of those things in F3 where it's just a one-hit wonder. And hopefully, I mean, he did, he did consistently well over the weekend, I, I found, as well with the other two races. So hopefully that's, that's a sign that Barcelona was was the beginning like it was for many of them and they're just getting getting to grips with the, with racing again and now now it's all game on yeah i'm uh i'm a big fan of uh, the overtakes we saw in race one and my limited uh, memory of last year and what i caught up on you see a lot of drivers who don't always you know get podiums every single race it's you know the antithesis to f1 and it's not drivers who are going to consistently win and win and win and win. And points consistency is what's going to be key for this championship as Hauger has shown this weekend, no victories, but he's leading the championship. He's extended his championship lead. Um, and another person I think who is deserving of all the shout outs because we saw Smolia, you know, I think he started P6 to take that win in the first race. But Victor Martin was uh, going nuts this weekend. He looked like a man possessed home race. And Jacob, he was going to be gaining quite a few French fans, I think. Yeah, certainly. And what a place to do it in front of his home fans. And it's great to see the crowd back as well. You know, the consistency you showed this weekend is really a, a, you know, a testament to his true driving ability that we spoke about in the last podcast as well. I think we're going to become big uh, fans of Martin's here on the uh, GP Grandstand podcast. And he was you know, unlucky not to get uh, three podiums in three races obviously losing out to Colette there in the third race, which we'll touch on in a bit. But yeah, great consistency. And I think, you know, along there with the uh, drivers we've mentioned previously, and Smolly as well could maybe be included in that, I'd certainly think that he could be, you know, given a bit of time, certainly uh, in the title fight this year. Yeah, I think uh, getting two and nearly three podiums at your home race is probably almost uh, better than grabbing a single win for <laughs> for Bartas because he was just to... to turn up and be as strong as he was we'll talk about our top three and bottom three at the uh, the end of the podcast of course but I think it's going to be a shoe in for everybody here it was it really really impressed me and that's not to say he didn't impress in Spain but very very strong uh gaining lots of positions um which is kind of a good segue for a certain Arthur Leclerc who gained a mammoth amount of positions in race one so Paul Leclerc is, is come in and has had, is it the same tyre as well, the same wheel? He's had punctures in qualifying in the first race. Uh, and now he's, he's gone from going, getting no points to grabbing pole position and a win <laughs> in race two this time around. Tebo, grabbing 18 places in a race, that's, uh, that's no mean feat. How, how impressed were you with Leclerc's fight back? I was thinking, as you were saying earlier, about you weren't too sure about uh, the reverse grid twice. If you're Arthur Leclerc, it doesn't matter because you're just going to be an absolute beast regardless. Um, no, it was kind of after after the disaster of qualifying, you thought, oh, that's another round where it's unfortunate, but we're just not going to see him anywhere. And he just thought, well, no, I'm not doing this again. And just it was, I think the thing that impressed me most was that not only the fact that he got from the back up into a reverse grid pole for the second uh, sprint race and managed to then dominate that, which you you kind of see that occasionally, more, more so in the feature race for F2 and F3. I think if you've got uh, the reverse pole or pole for the feature race, you're more likely to run away with it a bit. 
But I think what impressed me the most was the fact that in the feature race on Sunday, when it was when it was wet, he still managed to climb up from 30th to 13th. And it's like he can do that in the wet and the dry. <laughs> that's not too bad. And that's the people at Prima and people maybe at Alfa uh, Romeo Ferrari who are thinking, hmm, so it's not just not just one look that's good. It's, it's not a Schumacher kind of thing where uh, Michael is good, but Ralph is kind of, yeah, he's all right. It's kind of, oh, maybe we've got two Charles Leclerc kind of style drivers here, which for them, they, you've got to be thinking they're just laughing in Ferrari. Laughing at Ferrari. It was great to see, Jacob, the uh, the Ferrari drivers, the Ferrari drivers, the Ferrari drivers of Leclerc and then the manager of Bonotto coming to watch after the race. How um, how much of a impression do you think that will leave in them? Of course, they're going to look at positions and there's a good amount of quality drivers in the Ferrari Driver Academy. But Leclerc maybe doesn't have to win the championship to prove his credentials. What do you think? Well, certainly not. And it's going to be, I'd say, argue it's going to be hard for him to win the championship after, you know, fairly unlucky weekend in Spain. But, you know, how unlucky has it been for him? You know, two punks in, in, in two consecutive qualifying sessions. And he's been down the back of the grid there. So, but he's done all he can this weekend. You know, getting up to 12th and 30th is fantastic. And he's put himself in reverse with pole. And he absolutely dominated the second race there. It wasn't the uh, the greatest spectacle, I must admit. But, you know, as neutrals, that's not great for us. But it's great for Leclerc. And, you know, what a... What a way to do it in front of, as you say, there, Bonotto and I think Schumacher came down as well. And, and then obviously uh, Leclerc was there as older brother. And it's great to get a victory and certainly put himself um, in the in the uh, in contention for you know a future Ferrari drive later on. Uh, do you think, and this is a long way away now because we're going to be talking at least two years, uh, but most likely half a decade or so, could we see two Leclercs in the same team, Jacob? Is that, is that a possibility? That same team are likely being Ferrari? Well, yeah, it's a very big if. Obviously, there's loads of other uh, drivers um, gunning for that seat. Obviously, I think Leclerc is going to be for our, uh, well, Charles Leclerc is going to be their, their main prospect. He's certainly going to be there for a, for a very long time. Um, and then you've got obviously Nick Schumacher coming through, and you've also got there, um, you know, several other drivers as well coming through. You've also got Callum Eilock to consider what will happen with him. Will he get a drive in F1 and stuff? So, yeah, it's certainly going to be it's certainly going to be hard for him. But you know, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. But yeah, we are talking. Four, five, maybe even six years down the line, if at all. That'd be a hell of a sight to see. I'd love to see that just from the romantic element of it. And you mentioned the boring race. Um, the boring, yeah, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a, a showstopper, was it? The the second race, uh, Leclerc cruises to grab that, uh, grab the victory, and he'll be very happy for a, a boring race himself. But then we wake up Sunday. Rumours come around, you see pictures on Twitter, rain at France, thinking F1's going to be great with some rain. That didn't come to fruition in terms of the weather element, but it certainly led to a topsy-turvy race in race three, Timo. How did you, uh, how did you find race three? Did it make up for races, race two's sins? It was, if you again pardon the slight pun, there a bit of mixed conditions for me in my head on that one. <laughs> I thought um, it, was, it was one of the... I, I feel like the second sprint race is definitely the least exciting of the weekend for me, but I still think that it peaked with the, with the first sprint race. I enjoyed I enjoyed the feature race and it was it was a lot of fun to watch. But I think for the rain element that was there, there could have been a bit more a bit more action, a bit more drama to for my liking. But it was still it's still a decent decent showing nonetheless. And uh, I think one of my I, I got to give a shout out to I think it was Guzmed who was who I mean normally F three they don't do pit stops and they're not really prepared for it um but he had nothing to lose ultimately and just went and stuck on some some fresh pair of boots and some some slicks and just did a decent job of it considering there wasn't much time left in the race and got considering how far back off last place he was when he came out the, the pits thing was something silly like 20 seconds to then get all the way up to 19th by the end whilst you're still not going to get any points for it you i think for his home race for that for a driver that not many people may know, you've got to think that's not too bad, is it? Yeah, the uh, the fastest lap um, was uh, <laughs> almost five a, seconds quicker or something. The, uh, almost like, a Ooh. certainty, wasn't it, for him? But it made me think because I saw some some comments about some dry uh, some uh, some critics, I guess, talking about how much quicker could the, the drivers at the front end of the grid, you know, the ones that we are likely to see 
set the fastest lap usually, and that's with with no disrespect to De Giroux, but I would love to have seen one of the drivers, maybe around sixth or seventh, come in, take the extended pit stop, and then put on those slick tyres, because to get an advantage of about, well, we're talking about six plus seconds a lap for him, it could have been eight to ten seconds maybe for a, for a front runner who's comfortable in the conditions. It would have been bonkers to see, and F3 is essentially three sprint races, right? We don't see pit stops in them. Mm. So it's a feature race, but it's giving you the, the feature race just by default because it's uh, the same way that the grid line... Same amount of laps and everything. Yeah, ex exactly. Same amount of laps as over two races, but it gives you proper proper points this time. But yeah, I would have I would have absolutely loved it, but it wasn't meant to be. Um, but Dennis Hauger, he extends his lead, Jacob, in the championship now. Is he continuing to be the favourite? Uh, is Leclerc and Coldwell had a DNF, uh, so his Prima teammates, the ones you'd think would be his rivals, are slipping by a little bit. Is, would one poor round for Hauger completely turn this championship upside down? Well, of course, we saw what you know, four or five rounds to go, and but you'd certainly think that Hauger and one of the Primas coming into the season would have been the favourites. Obviously, Leclerc's had a uh, Poor weekend in Spain, picked up no points, and he's only still, although he had you know three fantastic drives, only managed to pick up 15 points here. So you still think that Hauger was the favourite. Colwell had another DNF in the first race, didn't he? And yeah, I, don't, I think the Hauger is probably the best driver, or more certainly the most consistent driver out of the three. But then you've got to think that you've know, got to consider Smolia as well coming through there, and Martins, we've mentioned before as well. So yeah, it's certainly going to be an interesting battle as we head to um, head to America. But yeah, certainly going to be um, interesting to see what's going to happen. Yeah, it's Coldwell in race three. I think you complained about, was it <laughs> Kyle Collette that he was uh, very, very angry about for <laughs> breaking his suspension, bless him. But then we had uh, Logan Sargent with the really bizarre... I've not, I don't remember the last time I've seen the, the black and orange flag get called out uh, mm. to have his rain light that was broken and it seemed like a, a hell of a way to get a, essentially a DNF because he had to come in and they couldn't fix a light. But... Safety, I understand why, uh, but yeah, a bit, a bit of a weird one for, for Logan Sargent. I do want to shout out to Colette as well, as he had a bit of a, a struggle of a weekend, but to overtake his teammate in, uh, in Victor Martin's at his home race on that final, um, on the final race in race three, and we saw Victor Martin's kind of doing that kind of, uh, for the people listening rather than watching, waving his hand. Uh, and the commentators spoke about it a little bit. Was he saying, go on, get after them? Or was he saying, what the hell are you doing? It was kind of, I think it was an old go-karting technique saying just, I'm not going to fight you with teammates, go and get on with it. Which, if that was the case, got, I think, quite a mature decision from Martins there because you could do, if, I don't know if I'd do the same thing, but, oi, get back here. <laughs> I'm, I'm clearly faster than you. Come back. I don't know, I've just made a mistake somewhere, but I think it just, it's that, Maybe championship material for Martins there, showing that he knows he's still going to get solid points. Yeah, a third podium would be nice, but I've already got two for the weekend. I can live with that. And just don't do anything silly and give his teammate an opportunity because, again, maybe you're maximising team points there. I don't know how much of that was going through his head whilst he's going down the start finish straight, but um, I don't. he didn't seem annoyed about it and he didn't attack him again for the rest of the race. So it was, uh, it was interesting and uh, good teamwork. No, whether no they meant malice. it or not. <laughs> no malice there, I don't think. But yeah, you could be right. Martin looking at how Guru is up ahead and he's had no chance of catching him. So might as well drop him a few points as well for his benefit because it could be a head-to-head -head between the two of them. Um, and we also should really have a big shout out to the winner of race three, Dewan, who wants to step out of his, his father's shadow uh, and make a name for himself. He's we've got Jack Dewan as a, as a race winner now. Jacob, uh, he seemed quite impressive. He seemed solid most of the weekend and then took a few positions in that final race and looked quite comfortable for the win in the end. Yeah, he, um, yeah, it was a really, really, really solid performance in the wet. Um, I thought that, you know, um, Vesti started from pole, didn't he? And Vesti just never looked comfortable and obviously how they took lead. But it was great to see him do, and I think he masked the conditions well. And certainly when it went from wet to, the, you know, the dry line started to appear, I certainly thought that he lo looked the most comfortable out there on track. And I think he got the move done with, was it three or four laps to go? Mm. It was certainly a great move, great move as well on uh, the championship leader. So, yeah, he really, really, really impressed me there. And it's great for him to recover his first victory. I'm taking full credit for this one, by the way, because in the F3 preview I did for GP Grandstand before the before the weekend, I said he was doing good, and he did. So, 
all I'm saying. Uh, Timo, we want people to go on the website rather than approve <laughs> the website. So if we have less of that, we don't want to admit that sort of stuff. But no, <laughs> very, very, very good punning. And yeah, it is well worth a shout out to Duan, who's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, it's, it's difficult to know. And I think we spoke last time when Efri were racing. There's a lot of names and you do concentrate on the names that you kind of recognize and Duan being one of them. Schumacher, who fell backwards again a little bit, being another and I did look out for doing, and yeah, very, very impressive. I was, uh, it's nice to see another race winner and potentially somebody later in the champ- uh, later in the season who could be a championship contender. Uh, I've got a bit of housekeeping as well that we need to do because this, the last time we recorded in the podcast and a couple of podcasts before we spoke about the driver academies, it seems that uh, the motorsport world are listening to us and just want to scupper our stuff and make it out of date immediately. So, we spoke about Chauvet losing his seat and then a, a Laszlo tote ends up getting COVID and wish Laszlo a, a speedy recovery. And then we had Pierre-Louis Chauvet jumping in and taking the Campos seat this weekend. Unfortunately, another poor qualifying uh, for Campos and he was well down the order, but coming back and maybe sniffing uh, another seat. Good to see him racing at his home race as well. And then we spoke, of course, about our preferred academies and ranked those only for what the matter of two weeks later for a bit of academy news so Correa is now going back to the Sauber Academy and that's great to see Uh, just it's like almost a fairy tale story of it's not redemption art it's not like a bad person that's done anything but it's (laughs) rising up again and it's great yeah really really great to see and I I saw Chris Medlin put a tweet out saying just how we can't really overstate how much this guy is racing with the injuries that he sustained and having is it a totally different sort of pedal so he can adjust the brake pressure and stuff. Just The amount of extra work that Correa has had to do this year to want to be racing is a miracle, let alone racing and doing well. And then the rainy condition, oh, just, yeah, well done. So I'm, I'm delighted for Sauber to... Very much a rocky story with him at the moment, isn't it? Just a nice little, nice little comeback, which is just great to see. Yeah, it really, really is. And then also Isaac Hadjar has joined the Red Bull junior team and he's in Formula Regional, Frecker. Fair, they didn't have many members before, so it's good to see the numbers. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, bizarre timing of Hajar joining for next year. So he's not joining this year, he's joining next year. But I don't know if that would have affected our decision um, to rank uh, the academies as they are. We saw Jacob, you saying it's one of the weakest that you've seen it. So maybe Hajar can bolster their uh, performance. But speak about Red Bull, their junior programme did okay in DTM, where we saw Liam Lawson taking a win. And Alex Albon, is, is he part of the junior team? I don't know what the situation is with, uh, with Mr. He's, Albon. He's, this, he's in one of the DTM teams. I'll, I'll admit I don't follow an awful lot of, outside of Lawson, Albon and Flush, so just to keep an eye on things with there. Um, but I think he, he did all right over the weekend. I'm not sure. I don't think he's in the same team. Hopefully it's not quite the Alpha Tauri in there either for him, just for that mental game. But um, yeah, I think they, did, they, they all did all right. But uh, Lawson, definitely the most impressive there for me. This yes. weekend because again it's just it's a different uh, different kettle of fish of racing for him. So yeah, if you can go around winning in uh, in tin tops as I like to call them uh, and in single seaters, then you're doing something right. So really encouraging from Lawson. Uh, of course, we'll see him back racing Formula Two soon enough, but keeping himself busy and yeah, a bit a bit of rough uh, territory for a certain Alex Albon if uh, you're getting outperformed by your more inexperienced driver. And who knows what's going to happen with that second Alpha Tauri seat next season. And do you want to actually, let's talk about that briefly. Jacob, we saw a lot of rumours that Gasly could join Alpine opening a seat there at Alpha Tauri. That's not going to happen now. We've seen Ocon, who no. has a monster of deal, uh, something we're not used to seeing. What's happening at Alpha Tauri then? Are they going to retain a Gasly driver? Because where's he going to go now? I think, you know, there was, <clears throat> pardon me, yeah, no, there was loads of uh, rumours going around in sort of, you know, the uh, pre-season that, you know, he was, you know, shooing that 2022 for, for Alpine and then obviously Alonso, Alonso, I think Alonso was quite another year, Dylan, 
you know, they're not going to get rid of Alonso unless he decides to uh, up and leave, which I don't think he will now. So, yeah, I think that there's no real other avenues you have to look at. So I think that, you know, we're going to see um, Gazi there for potentially a long time. You know, is he going to go back to Red Bull? But I think they're now going to retain Perez. I think Perez has really started to come into his own. So I can't really see where he goes. But unless we look up the grid, you've got the McLaren, who I think they're tied down for a long time. You've got um, Ferrari, they're tied down for a long time. And then you're, then you're looking sort of down the grid. Aston Martin, maybe, once Vettel retires. I think I'd, if I was Aston Martin and Lawrence Stroll, I'd certainly take a punt on someone like Gasly. But for the time being, and certainly the next you know, next season and, and the season after that, I can't really see where else he goes, to be honest. I think if... Um, I think Marco was saying that he's contracted for Alcantara for another year. Granted, that doesn't mean an awful lot when they play musical chairs as much as they do. But if that is the case, and for whatever reason... He then doesn't go to Red Bull for 24 if Alonso decides after next year that it was nice to come back, but I'll I'll get off the train here. Then maybe Alpine is still on the table for him. Have two French drivers at the French team. Couldn't be too bad for them. I mean, it scuppers the young drivers program a bit, but it wouldn't be the first time. Um, and if he keeps performing as well as he has been this year, which for a midfield team, you've got to think he's... He's, he's right there whenever there's an opportunity to grab something he's just been he's been he's been right there so it's another one of those sort of things you don't want to end up where you're in a situation like we had with Perez last year where there was a chance where he wouldn't be on the grid mm. so it's it's just a matter of finding a spot maybe with the new regulations and new team will just come along really quickly at the right time and maybe maybe that's the outside thing he'll go there he'll join Porsche in 24 there we go <laughs> I just, I, for me, it's, it, it kind of creates this really weird situation that Gasly needs to kind of move on for the benefit of Red Bull, depending, of course, how Sonoda recovers the rest of this season. His qualifying mistakes are potentially going to prove costly, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a moment. But for next year and maybe beyond, we've got Yuri Vips, Liam Lawson, as we've already mentioned, um, Jay Handeruvula, of course, all in Formula 2, wanting to get a promotion up. We've already spoke about Hajar joining. Iwasa, we spoke about. He had the five-second penalty in the race, but performed admirably. And Jack Crawford. Dennis Hauger and Duan. I don't forget about Albon either. And, and Albon. Mark. Yeah, so you've got all these drivers. And yeah, saying da- Duan and Hauger are part of the program, but not part of the junior team, however that works. But there's plenty of drivers. And are Red Bull going to be in a situation where they've got two teams, but nowhere to put them? It, it just seems bonkers to uh, of this possibility but yeah who knows but let's yeah we'll have to wait out this to see how this this works out but let's go and talk about Red Bull and Red Bull in Formula One because we had a great great Grand Prix with the racing uh, and Red Bull walking away leading the championship and extending their championship lead with a complete masterclass on Mercedes terrific watching so Max Verstappen won the race based off of a superior strategy and essentially spaining uh, Lewis Hamilton rather than the way around. And for me, France, we spoke disparagingly about it. A lot of people did. Those first two races, 2018, 2019, weren't great. But this was a nail biter from almost the start, but right until the finish of this race. Did, uh, did Max Verstappen impress you apart from that one little mistake at the first corner, Jacob? His, uh, his, win and Red Bulls win. A great race for everybody to watch, right? Yeah, that was fantastic. I mean, not just a great weekend for Max Verstappen, but Red Bull and certainly the strategy element getting one over on Mercedes there. I'm, I must admit, I can't remember much about the previous two iterations of this Grand Prix. 2018, I was in a hospital bed and 2019 was just 2019 French Grand Prix and I can't remember much. I think I got a severe headache from just looking at the, uh, the blue and red painted lines but yeah, we were all um, doing a little rain dance on Sunday morning. Obviously, I woke up to the uh, F3 being at, you know, with an absolute soap track. And, and then the inevitable, inevitable tweets start to come through that, you know, the rain is clearing up and it's going to be a dry race. And a dry race in France normally means a boring one stop right. Well, not yesterday. What a fantastic race that was. And actually, I put that up there with one of the best races so far this season. Admittedly, the opening stages weren't that good. You know, we thought that it's just going to be uh, Hamilton sort of may- maybe leading off after the Sappens mistake there at, at turn two. You know, it was fantastic. And it certainly left us guessing right until the end. Red Bull were in the lead after um, undercutting uh, Lewis. 
they got back into the lead and they, you know, they had, you know, they uh, made the bold call to come in again. At the time, I was thinking, hmm, okay, maybe this is, maybe is this going to work? But it certainly paid off in the end. Yeah, the uh, the bold call took people by surprise, and most surprising for me was Mercedes not then trying to counter it with one of the two drivers that were hassling Max. And this was a benefit, of course, of Perez being up there, unlike his predecessors, that they'd have to overtake Perez. But Perez was yeah, a chess piece, I guess, for Red Bull to use. But splitting the strategy seemed like the most logical thing to do as an armchair expert. Timo, were you thinking Mercedes dropped the ball a little bit here? Yes and no for me a bit, because I feel like I was expecting them to bring Lewis in, if not immediately the lap after, definitely within the next five laps to try and combat that in some way, just because, I mean, I know we always hear Lewis on the radio saying about the tyres and then he pulls out purple sector after purple sector, but at some point it's he's actually going to be right and the tyres aren't actually working for him. Um, so I was a little surprised at that, but I think for me the thing that annoyed me was, and I mean, I know it's rare for me to, to be... Um, mean about Bottas but I feel like he he didn't really put up too much of a fight I mean I know his, he was saying his tyres weren't great either but at the same time I feel like especially when you've watched the the rest of the race after Max overtook him he seemed to put up much more of a fight against Perez um, to defend his own position rather than to help Lewis and overall the team on trying to maximise points there so I wonder how much he was really struggling with the tyres and why he, there wasn't as much fight in him when Max came along to overtake him. And he made the mistake, obviously. But again, this isn't F3 or F2 where you can forgive that kind of thing as easily because you're five years at the top team. That's kind of... You're not there because you made, make rookie mistakes. You're there because you're a good driver. And I just find that a bit... So as much as the Mercedes strategists did hold up their hands and say, we did mess up on this one, Lewis, I feel like... It wasn't just them. There was there's lots of little chinks in their arm at the moment, which obviously Red Bull, you don't need to tell them twice before they go and capitalize it like a shark sniffing out a drop of blood ten miles away. But um yeah, I mean it was it, was, it kind of reminded me of Bahrain 2.0 in a sense for this year in terms of the strategy, especially towards the end. Because so it's like, okay, where's the track limits that Max is gonna need to <laughs> hand over Lewis back to the place there? Are we gonna get a reverse of that maybe? But in the end it was just a, a pretty much clean pass and there was nothing much after that, the Lewis could do about it. So it was, I'm going to say 53 laps for Grand Prix, it flew by for me. Yeah, I, uh, I think that the Bottas radio was really telling, actually, of uh, he can't really be doing with this sort of stuff. And I, it's a sort of Bottas radio that I don't think we've really heard before. I know we had that famous... not this early in the season. <laughs> no, well, I was going to say, I had that famous uh, to whom it made concern back in Australia a few years ago, but that wasn't directed at the team, right? But... This was a, a furious Bottas, which does suggest to me he might not care anymore because he might know something that we I don't. I think it suggests he kind of knows his own fate already. I think he knows he's on the way out. It was, it was one of the things I feel like the only card he's got left to play, if he wants to stay there, is to play the team game. <laughs> and he just didn't at all this mm -hmm. on, on those two occasions there of just not really defending Max and then the team radio. So Thodo said after the race that he loved that team radio. But I feel like, yeah, are you just saying that for the media and then you're going to go give him a... Bit of a bit of a hounding later, but it's uh, it's interesting to see where the chinks are forming in Mercedes armor now and how that might affect the rest of the season. Well, Jacob, what do you think of this then? So there's a theory I had in my head after the race that we saw Red Bull. I, I, I want to say this right now that Mercedes have out strategized Red Bull on the other hand as well. So this is going to be a, a great battle throughout the season, hopefully, of each team trying to outperform the other. But are we seeing potentially that Mercedes weren't as bulletproof as we may have thought before, just by the virtue that they had no real competition? And this is the first year in many a year that Red Bull are their equals in terms of speed, in terms of strategy, and take from that what you will, Ferrari fans, that they are maybe not as genius as we may have thought before, and they were potentially making incorrect calls before and getting away with it. I mean, 
Yeah, I thought that's, that's, that's a fair reflection. I mean, they have made some good calls before and there has been competition, you think, Hungary 2019. But, you know, realistically, they've had no real competition, I'd say, since 2014. 26, uh, 2017, 2018, Ferrari, you know, had the pace, but we all know how bad Ferrari's uh, strategy elements have been. They've been very lacklustre there on the pit wall. So, yeah, I would certainly say that we haven't really, um, haven't really seen some great calls. But what I would say is this. You know, they, like you say, they haven't had the competition there. So we, we never would have really known. And I think that because last season, Mercedes had certainly one of their biggest advantages in the last seven years. And then Red Bull have sort of come out of nowhere and then become the fastest car. They've certainly been left with a lot, a lot of questions to be answered. Like, and I don't think all the time they're going to have the answers. Because, you know, you've got Perez up there as well. It's not just because last season it was just Max up there. It was, you know, Valtteri, Lewis and then Max occasionally in certain races. This year they've got Perez to contend with as well. And more often than not, Perez will be ahead of Bottas and Max will be ahead of Lewis. So they've got certainly a lot more elements to contend with. And, you know, I think there's a few pressure cracks starting to show there. And, mm. you know, Red Bull have got a 37-point lead in the championship now. And it was very telling for me, and I'm sure you might have heard this on the Sky coverage as well. This is very much a Mercedes track, and Red Bull have just come and cleaned house. And we're at Austria for the next two, and we all know how Max loves that. And Mercedes generally don't like that. I think 2019 and 18, last season was a bit different, given how, given how much of an advantage Mercedes had. But, you know, if... You know, the pressure's really, really going to tell once we get to Silverstone and if Max picks up, you know, the next two victories in, in Spielberg. So, yeah, the pressure's really on and I, I can't wait to see the next 16 races. I really can't. I must say, I think if we're seeing a bit of role reversal from Mercedes and Red Bull, kind of talking places from the last couple of years of where they've been, then and with Bottas doing as well or as bad as he is at the moment, um, I wonder maybe if we. I mean, there's all the there's all the speculation rumors that are all but confirmed that Russell's going there next year. But I don't think they would swap him out mid season. But maybe if Bottas doesn't deliver for the or keeps on his, on the path that he's going on at the moment, then uh, you know Nico Hulkenberg's free could come come into it after the summer break. You never know. It could be depending on how things get how bad things get for Mercedes between now and the summer break, they might decide throw caution to the wind and just do something really out of character, which, I mean, wouldn't we kind of love to see that as they've kind of self-imploded a little bit? And that is the voice of Eddie Jordan, anybody listening, <laughs> with uh, absolutely wild thoughts like this. But yeah, it's, it's going to be great to watch uh, all season. If Bottas really doesn't um, give a hoot about staying uh, and potentially throws the championship, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to speculate on stuff like this and let's let's face it he was on much older tires when defending against Verstappen and, and Perez had the long stint as well to give him fresher tires and you know, I think this is what I enjoyed so much about the Grand Prix actually and I've tweeted about this I've wrote it in our uh, gpgrandstand.com reflection piece no retirements no safety cars no red flags, no crashes, nothing. But it still gave. Not even a yellow flag, Jim. It was amazing. Like if there were any yellow flags, I don't think you, I don't think there were. I think you're right. And if there were any, it would have been somebody went off the track briefly. This was a race which showed why F1 is great and doesn't need all that stuff. And I think we get hung up, modern F1 fans and probably new F1 fans, on a race like Baku because it's unpredictable because there's these tire failures and all of a sudden there's a red flag, there's a three lap sprint to the end and Hamilton breaks and goes off the track at the first corner. And we mistake that for this is a great race because Baku was a snoo an absolute snooze fest for the first 45 odd laps, right? In my opinion, I really, I thought this was DRS trains, very boring. And then this race didn't need any of this unpredictability. It was just pure strategy. And what was key for me was having strategy options a one-stopper clearly could work as Perez got to the podium on one but a two-stopper was potentially faster as we saw and it was all of what three seconds faster and that over the course of an hour and a half Grand Prix is minuscule really and then we saw with Norris who looked like his strategy that forgotten about him yet he had these fresher tires at the end and got Back past Ricardo to take the best of the uh, the best of the rest award in P5. This was just Formula One for me, and I'm so passionate about it. This was the the epitome of what a great Formula One race is, and it doesn't need all this extra fluff. But let's talk about these long strategies. Stroll <laughs> had his track limit violation, meaning that he couldn't make it through into Q2. Starts 19th, 
and then ends up getting points because of a long strategy. Vettel also a couple of points for him. And again, the long strategy. Perez, who is the tire whisperer, a long strategy, gets P3. How do we make Formula One like this every week, Jacob? This is this is to be if Pirelli were getting uh, a lot of flack at the last race for tires exploding, having tires which can eke a bit of life out of them and degrade at the same time to create different strategies. This is exactly what the sport needs. Yes, yeah, exactly what the sport needs. Going back to the, the point you made previously, I think a lot of modern F1 fans do certainly get caught up in you know, the crashes, the red flag element, because in the last seven years, we haven't had this strategy battle. You know, I, I certainly can't remember. This takes me back to you know 2013 and 2012 when I started getting into the sport, and it certainly feels refreshing and new again. So F1 certainly needs um, all the battles throughout the field, and it needs those uh, different tire strategies as well. You know, certain uh, drivers who can look after their tires no longer be at Perez, and certain drivers making two stops where you know that unpredictably comes into play. So I think that, you know credit to Pirelli this weekend. I think it was a lot better performance from them. I think they bought tires that certainly suited the track as well, and it you know allowed for those different strategy elements to fail. I think the tire pressure uh, situation may have played into that a little bit. Then it certainly um, left teams with a you know they would have obviously done their homework before the race, but certainly left it on the cusp of being a one stop and a two stop. Certainly coming into the race, we all thought, you know, France is going to be a boring one stop. But, you know, with it being a two stop, that's what made it, you know, the great race that it really was. An optional two stop at that to make it a race where the, the two strategies could be, you know, if you play the Formula One game, it tells you this is the, the, the strategy to do and how long it was. It was like that, that this one could be faster, but you're going to be slow at the end, as you saw Hamilton. And I did think depending on how the last few laps went it was Verstappen won and was you know, a terrific drive to, to catch up on uh, three cars and Perez jumping right out of the way, real team player, scared Bottas off the track and Hamilton defenceless. So great drive from Verstappen, but Hamilton doing his typical, my tyres are gone, but still started <laughs> pumping in some fast lap times at the end. I thought if either Verstappen or Hamilton won, it would have been a deserved drive. Um, but for us as fans, Terrific, just terrific to watch. Um, yeah, speaking it certainly kept us guessing. I think with five laps, I thought Hamilton was actually going to win it in the end. I mean, the gap maintained around five seconds, and he was actually um, putting in slightly faster lap times, you know, than Verstappen with much older tyres. So I thought, you know, Hamilton, you know, done the greatest trick in history, the greatest actor in F1. He was certainly going to come through with another victory there, but you no know, credit to Verstappen in the end was fantastic. It's, it's always a thing, even if you are Max Verstappen, even if you are pressure tyres and coming up and you're, everything's going your way, you've still got to pass for Lewis Hamilton. So it's never a guarantee. <laughs> no, it's not. But I want to talk briefly about passing because um, the honey badger, Daniel Ricciardo, haven't really seen him turn up this, this year up until now. And Timo, is Daniel Ricciardo back? Um, he could have finished comfortably in fifth place if not for the contrary strategy with Lando Norris going a bit longer with the fresher tyres but great move at the start of the race and then it was a McLaren double act with both of the drivers getting past all of the midfield essentially um, it was was it Alonso first then Leclerc and then Leclerc got scared went into the pits great driving from Ricardo. yeah I mean I think he finally managed to get to the post office to buy some stamps because he absolutely <laughs> sent it didn't he so it was just it was just, it was the exact kind of drive he needed this weekend. And I know we said that the last couple of weekends just didn't work out, but, you know, third time lucky and it came true. So it was just really refreshing to see kind of old Ricardo come back and just do exactly what we know him for. And Lando as well, they're keeping him honest. Because, I mean, that overtake on Alonso as well, down the back in sector three was just... <laughs> He saw an opportunity and he took it. It was kind of a bit like um, Uasa in, in, in the F3 race. He just kind of went for it. And you just, I love that there was that parallel there. Um, so, yeah, McLaren just kind of really seemed to have woken up now. And hopefully, Ricardo is back on form for that because it'd be great to see that going forward. And they finally got more than two points ahead of Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship, which, as fun as that is, it's just nice to have it different from two points and just swapping back and forth all the time. So, yeah. Um, it's because it, it's it's one of the things I think outside of Red Bull, it's tricky to find a team at the moment where both drivers are on the level where they both have maybe I mean Perez might not be on the same level as Max, but he does his role perfectly, and it's hard to find that in the other teams at the moment. And I think McLaren was the closest thing to having two awesome drivers. It was just Ricardo wasn't quite there yet, and hopefully now 
he has. <laughs> so it's it was just great to see all that overtaking and just Honey Badger is back. A force to be reckoned with. I think one of the teams that's potentially at the opposite end of that um, with regards to equality, Williams being one, you take from that what you will, but um, Alpha Tauri with Pierre Gasly showing just how quick mm. the Alpha Tauri is, but Jacob Sonoda is he's either going, you know, guts of glory, right? That he is from that Bahrain race, I thought, wow, this this driver got graduated from, from F2 so quickly and he could be immense. Uh, but he's qualifying. What's he doing? Why has he thrown away this chance? Yeah, I think it's just all a bit too kamikaze and he's too quick to uh, try and impress. Was that the second or third qualifying crashes of this year? And how surprising he managed to find the barriers in France. You know, how surprising is that? Bring out a red flag in France. Well, he's certainly done well there. So certainly impressed with him on that front. But yeah, you know, with what we've said earlier on the podcast, you know, there's six or seven drivers, you know, earmarking for that spot, your album to consider as well. So he certainly really needs to pick it up. And, you know, we've got still what, 16 races. Yes, it is, of course, seven races into his F1 career. But there's so many drivers waiting in the wings that, you know, next time out when we go to Austria, and certainly, you know, there's going to be sort of a home race, really, for the Red Bull family, if you like. He's certainly really got to impress I think the big question is, where's Marco going to move from there if it hasn't worked? Yeah, well, this is... Next this to is Marco's the, house, I think. This, this is the thing, though, right? That he's, he's, going, he's going very quick. Like, there's, there's no doubt that he's got pace. But is he just trying too hard in qualifying to make these mistakes? And so it, it feels a bit like, you know, the... Um, Oh, what was it? I think it was the advertising sign back in Bahrain last year, which was quite funny placed because Max then crashed out right in front of the sign where it's like speed is nothing without control. <laughs> um, it just seems a bit reminiscent of that at the moment. We know he's got the pace. We've seen him in F2 last year. He can deliver the goods, but he just hasn't adapted to the F1 car, I don't think. Yet. And qualifying is just the big weakness there. So it's 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 annoying because it's it's, you can't do what Arthur Leclerc did in F3 and come from 30th to 12th, and it'd be really impressive because in F1, there's 10, A, 10 less cars, and B, 12th, you still don't get any points. So it's kind, kind of, of this kind of thing. Sort of, uh, kind of reminds me of sort of Grosjean in 2012. You remember he had the pace in that Lotus, and he was fantastically fast over the season. Great straight line to Green Spa. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But he was, yeah, of course, bloody hell. But yeah, he was... Um, really too quick to press, but, you know, he kept making those start run errors. So I think it's kind of reminiscent of that. And I think that, you know, we're, you know, we're big, as we said before, big Ecomaniacs here on GP Grandstand, but we certainly need to... Uh, certainly need to you're making it tricky at the moment. Yeah, he's very, making it very tricky. Yeah, he is. Um, I really... I'm really encouraged by the midfield battle we're getting. McLaren maybe just have the edge, but if their race pace is strong and their quality pace isn't so strong, it's actually going to make it entertaining. But I would love to see two Alpha Tauris fighting amongst it as well. Aston Martin doing well. Alpine seemed to have a bit of pace. Oak on a side. But even then, it looks like it could be a Titanic midfield battle. I think Mick also deserves a little bit of a shout out because it's kind of an awkward thing there. He did make it into Q2 on, on merit and time in the end. I mean, you can make a bit more did of that he, with Reichen and... and you, you know, it's it's sort of maybe there's a luck element to it in a way, but at the same time, that's that's racing. You've got to just take it when you can. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, conspiracy theories. Whatever could you be referring to, Jacob? Um, but I think it just a little shout out there because again, it just shows that even, I think maybe even if he hadn't, if or if he hadn't crashed, he still might have been at the top end of the bottom five. Mm. And I feel like in comparison to his teammate, that's still. There's still, it shows that they're making solid progress there, and he still would have beat Latifi at least, in my opinion. So, yeah, yeah, Latifi hasn't really done too much to impress me uh, this season at all. Uh, I know it's difficult to see with the Williams being so far down, but you said that Russell got P12 on pure merit this weekend in the race, so without a DNA the no, the no yellow flags no no yeah, ex- in there so exactly he, he went out to say that he was disappointed to not get any points because he finished uh, ahead of mm-hmm. ahead of ferraris and whatnot so yeah really really um, impressive drive from russell and less impressive for nicholas latifi uh we could talk about this great french weekend all day i think because i've as you probably could tell very passionate about how great formula one was and formula three I've got all day yeah of course <laughs> I don't know if our, if our fans and uh, listeners and viewers do, unfortunately. So 
So why don't we move Do into a the... charity live stream at some point and then we can talk to our hearts content <laughs> and get them and claim it's for a good cause. <laughs> a, a telephone. So why don't we talk about a top three and bottom three? Uh, and let's start with Formula Three to have more threes in that sentence. Timo, who are your top three drivers in Formula Three this week? First of which I don't think is going to surprise either of you. It's Arthur Leclerc, who's just what a drive. Um, and then I've chosen two drivers that um, you probably won't be on your list, but I think they deserve a shout out anyway. So it's Guzmed for his uh, performance in the feature race, because I just thought it was it was a risk that just really paid off nicely. And he got him on my radar. Now he's on this podcast in my voice. So that works brilliantly for him. It's exactly what he planned. Um and then despite the five second penalty, I think Iwasa did a pretty great job overall. And it was just an unfortunate thing of I think he could have maybe made the overtake if uh, without going over the line. So he still did some brilliant overtake before then. So really nice to see that from from a from a junior driver. Yeah, junior driver who was leading the race. Uh, great to see Iwasa driving so well. Jacob, your top three from Formula Three. Unlike the team, I've gone for a slightly more conventional top three. Obviously, no surprise to see Victor Martins on there. What a fantastic home weekend he had. Great consistency, picking up from what was a fantastic weekend in Spain as well. I've also gone for, yeah, I'm going to copy Timo here, Arthur Leclerc. Fantastic, picking up his first victory. Showed great consistency in all three races. Great overtakes as well, coming from what was a, a you know, really unlucky qualifying session. And I've gone for, yeah, slightly boring one here, really. But Dennis Howard, you know, he's maintained his championship leave there. So, yeah, Dennis Howard for me. And the uh, do you want me to the bottom three as well? Well, let me jump in with my top three first. So I had very, very similar. In fact, I had the same, I had four drivers that need to whittle down to three. And Jacob, you made it a little bit easier uh, by calling out Dennis Hauger there. So I had Victor Martins because what a terrific, terrific weekend he had. Um, Leclerc did so well overtaking so many drivers. Martin did the same overtaking drivers at the front of the grid who were arguably quicker than the ones at the back so that one uh, don't need to explain Leclerc for those same reasons to go from 30th to grabbing a win reverse grid or not is a terrific terrific effort and I don't know how many cars he would have overtaken over the entire weekend but it'd be in excess of the amount like that meme from cars, cars just I am speed <laughs> I, am, I am speed Arthur Leclerc well done and then yeah, it was a toss-up between Championship Leader Hauger and Smolia, and I'll give it to Alexander Smolia because I think he deserves a shout-out because I thought that first race was terrific, and to be the victor after all of that, yeah, I, I can give you a shout-out. That was that was great. So more of that, please. Um, double F3 winner, Alexander Smolia. Great stuff. Bottom three, uh, let's go with you, Jacob. You seem to be itching for it, so let's let's hear your bottom three from F3. So I've chosen uh, Villa Gomez as my first drive at the bottom three. He had a um, just a really messy weekend. I think he had a couple of instances towards the back there. Philip Ogran as well. You know, I didn't really see much of him. And I've actually gone for a driver who, um, you know, surprisingly did quite well. And we thought that F3 might be his level in Nanini. But I think this weekend, you know, he picked up a podium, didn't he, in Spain? Like, yeah, it was, we were all, I think, all solidly impressed with him. But this weekend, yeah, I didn't pick up any points and was you know, absolutely nowhere for me in a, in a series where you should be performing better than that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump in here because I also have Nanini that I was hoping to see a much better showing than what we'd see in Formula 2 and Formula 3. I thought we said last time on Formula 3 that Nanini grabbed the podium. Maybe we'd see him on the podium more times, but very, very anonymous this time round. I've also uh, quite harshly maybe gone for Vesti because he grabbed pole position, which is a great effort, and I don't want to overlook that. But then he just fell backwards fell backwards all weekend and he got points I think in the second race but oh sorry in the uh, the final race I'll just double check before I go and make these erroneous claims but it just wasn't really a weekend worth remembering past getting a pole position which yeah a great great thing grab a couple of points for that but I expected more from him and I also went from Schumacher and specifically for Schumacher because of race one that he finished behind Leclerc despite starting on the front row at that when you are starting on the front row and then going down to 16th place, oh, that is that is rough. And I think he got um, just on the edge of points in race two. Yeah, 11th place there. Uh, I'm expecting Schumacher, I'm looking at, I said last time, a look out for the name and maybe that's making it a bit more difficult. But I think it's inexcusable to finish behind somebody who finishes in third place when you start in second. That's, uh, that's pretty rough. 
How about a bottom three from yourself, Tima? Well, you kind of nicked two of them, Jim, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> I'll make do with it anyway. Schumacher was on was on my list as well, just because, I mean, like you think there, for all those reasons, and it's just uh, you look out for the names that you know, and maybe this weekend he wished that you wouldn't. Um, so it was kind of unfortunate that Vesti as well. I'm kind of, I'm going to justify that because I don't think that was too hard. Because after seeing how well he drove last year, I think there was a lot of hope from this year, and there's just not been anything so much so far. I mean, pole position is all well and good, but if you can't do anything with it, then you know it's it's kind of useless in the, the day. I mean, Le- Leclerc and Smolier and all these kind of people have shown that it doesn't really matter where you start; you can still get a damn good result. So. Um, and then finally, I put Caldwell on there because he was the, the weakest link in the Prima train, I thought, this, this weekend. He kind of had a lot of opportunities and then nothing really came of it. I mean, it was a 1-2-3 at one point. I can't remember which race it was. I think it was race two. Race two yeah. um, but it just kind of it dropped out there. And then I think, he, did he crash out in the feature race? Exactly. Oh, was that cool? Wasn't it? They, uh, they ended up getting a DNF yeah. because of that. It was kind of after doing decently in Spain, it was just a bit unfortunate. So not not quite what we were expecting to see him. Yeah, you'd expect the Prima drivers to be right up there and um, grabbing 14th place. I think he qualified in the end. Not particularly impressive. Just want to clarify on the Vesti that he got one point in 10th place uh, in race two. And in race three, he gained eight points from a P6, but he did start on pole position. So I think we're fairly justified in that. And let's whiz through Formula One. I can imagine we're going to have some similar names popping up. So I, for my top three, I had Verstappen. No explanation needed. Daniel Ricciardo, because welcome back, Honey Badger. Great racing. Great to see you overtaking. And yeah, just a McLaren double act that a lot of us probably were excited to see before the season started that has only just Morkman come to Why is the comeback here? <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to give a bit of a shout out because I think a lot of people overlooked it to Lance Stroll to go from what was essentially the, well, it was the back row and he was in last place because Sino stuck from pit lane to grabbing a point. Strategy might have played a part in that because it went so long. But yeah, I think that's worthy with such a tight midfield of a, of a bit of a shout out because he still had to do it. Jacob, top three for Formula One. As you said, Jim Verstappen, you know, fantastic this weekend. He obviously made that mistake there in the first lap in turn two, but he showed the maturity that maybe he wouldn't have done in previous years to a good cool head and fantastic work from the Red Bull boys on the uh, pit bull as well and Christian Hall and everyone to lead home what was fantastic victory. So Verstappen is my first driver. Yep, I'm going to copy you as well, Jim, here for the uh, second driver, Daniel Ricciardo. I'm a big fan of his. He's my favourite driver on the grid and it's just great to see him back up there in, in P6. It was the first weekend where he really looked like the, uh, the true Daniel Ricciardo. And the third driver I've chosen is, shout out to George Russell, as we said previously, P12, you know, on pure merit, really, on pure pace. There was no, there was no incidents, there was no yellow flags, there was no retirement ahead of him. So, yeah, that is a pure and honest P12 for him there. Timo, your top three, please. I'm going to say, for the sake of a bit of variety, I'm going to go a little bit different. So, I've got uh, Gasly as one of my, my top three, just because, once again, it's kind of maybe not too surprising to me but again he's just driving the wheels off that car and just doing an absolutely sublime job with it so hats off to him then Darren Ricardo did a great job there this weekend so um, it's just great to see him back and then I mean he, it, it kind of tailed off a bit towards the end for, for Alonso but I'm going to stick him on the list as well because he showed uh, elements of being back towards the Alonso we know and love so hopefully that's a sign of things to come. I don't know if it was down to him or more of the car and the team in the end. So I think he's. Still, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be nice and give him that. One. And Jacob took Russell. So variety. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to know. Uh, I've all Alonso, of course, um, outperforming Ocon. So that's not been the case all season, which leads in nicely to having Ocon in my bottom three. Um, I thought on the back of a contract renewal that. He might have been a bit buoyed in front of his home crowd and fairly anonymous. Uh, Charles Leclerc as well. He just didn't seem to hook it up this weekend whatsoever. I know Ferrari were partly to blame for that, but Sainz comfortably outperformed him and um, finished well down the order with that second pit stop. And then Yuki Tsunoda, for reasons we've gone through already, um, yeah, he gained some positions back in the race. But when you're starting at 20th place, you need to be gaining a lot of positions back, like a certain Leclerc, to be able to uh, gain some points back and yeah Alpha Tauri could be in this 
best of the rest battle if they had two drivers um, going at full speed. And Gasly is yeah, he's showing just how good that car could be. Jacob, your bottom three from Formula One. Jim, have you been reading my mind again? Because that's the exact same bottom three that I have written down here. And for pretty much the same reasons, really. I um, mentioned the Ocon there. I thought, you know, in front of the home crowd, fans back in as well. And that contract extension we'd have seen. Um, you know, there's pace in that Alpine car as well. We saw Alonso up there in the points and certainly in the practice and qualifying sessions as well. Sonoda for that, you know, ridiculous qualifying crash. And just needs to really, you know, get back on it. And the Claire Ferrari were just really nowhere this weekend. But I think it was quite... An, Easy bottom three to predict, or, or to, not to predict, but to uh, can't read, can't look into the future, but um, certainly uh, put down on paper because I think lots of drivers had good weekends as well, and there was no mistakes in the race to really pull people out. So I think that yeah, it was quite an easy bottom three there to uh, deconstruct. And Timo, your bottom three. Bottom three for me, a bit of the same, but a little bit different because I don't think it was entirely Ocon's fault for everything happening to him. So I'm going to put his strategists on my my worst three list. Um, and then uh, Ferrari as a whole, just because they they had a great qualifying, just didn't didn't do anything with it. They just went backwards. And then for reasons that I've explained here and in plenty of other of our podcasts, Bottas. So it just uh, yeah, I know. But maybe I, I've been harsh to Ricardo, and look, it's worked for him. So maybe oh, you've, got, you've got ulterior motives, of course, Timo. That's uh, yeah, I mean, that's a harsh one on Bottas. I don't need to go into it now as we're wrapping up. But yeah, I think the, the strategists have a lot to blame for that, and Bottas was chasing the lead at one point. So um, hopefully we'll see more of that this year as the Mercedes and Red Bull battle continues. But one thing very excited to say just before we wrap things up, W Series is returning uh, next week, which is going to be great to see. So when we talk about F1 next time, there's no Formula 3, there's no Formula 2, but it's going to be Formula 1 and the W Series at Styria. Very, very excited to see that. Guys, excited to see W Series? Uh, Jacob? Yeah. Yeah, um... I'll be very honest here, I've not seen much of the W Series and I can't wait to spend my afternoon and evening watching the new W Series uh, w series documentary series. That'd be great. And it's great to see some drivers that we're not familiar with and, you know, different formats as well. And it's just refreshing to see new series. And, you know, like everyone here on the GP Grandstand podcast, we love ratings. I can't wait to see that. And apparently there are a few thunderstorms in the area as well. Yes, the weekend, but we all know how, uh, how that plays out. Certainly a bone dry racing coming. Yeah, indeed. Timo, you, uh, you saw this driven documentary. What do you think? Yeah, I uh, I did my my research and binged all six episodes yesterday, so it was uh, it was great fun. It was a great thing to to watch, and if you like Drive to Survive or you're a bit of a fan of it, then go go and watch. It gives you great insight into everything. And if you have no idea or you just want a recap of what happened last time out because it's been a little while, mm. then it's the perfect thing for you. And I mean, gives gives you an insight. I mean, there are a few drivers there like Nikki Kiyama, who I, I've heard of, but I didn't know an awful lot about. And it was just great to have. It kind of gave a nice bit of time to each driver, which um, you don't get that as much on drive survive maybe because of the access or they just like focusing on creating a bit of drama where there isn't any some of the time. But for this, it was just a nice balance throughout the whole thing and uh, some nice little insights on, 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 on the entire process from start to finish. So definitely recommend and it's got me very nicely hyped up for next weekend now. Yeah, it's great stuff. And if you do want to know a bit more about the drivers, we've interviewed several of them. You can find that on our YouTube channel. So look for those for those in the grandstand interviews. We've got some of the title contenders, such as Emma from the line and Bites Cavissa in there. Uh, and we've also got a Bruno Tomaselli interview that's going to be coming out any time now. So keep an eye out for that too. But until next time, we're going to be talking about W Series a bit more in full. Timo, where can people find your work? Of course, find me on GP Grandstand. And you can find me over on Drive Tribe and on YouTube. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, feel free to at t.elvis.daily.drivetribe. And Jacob? Yeah, well, Timo, you'll find all my written work on gvgrandstand.com. I'll be here on the podcast every Monday. And you can find me on Twitter at jacobphil 18 and for myself, you can find my work on gpgrandstand.com and fortlock.com for my satire F1 news. Search the F1 Week was on YouTube. And of course, I am on the Grand Prix Grandstand TV YouTube channel and the Talking F1 podcast where you can find me interviewing some of those W Series drivers. Uh, all those details are in the show notes or looking down below if you're watching on YouTube. We will be talking all about the Styrian Grand Prix next week and talking F all about W Series and Formula One. Keep your ears peeled for that. Thank you.